Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your ever-loving correction, your faithful instruction. God, set our hearts right as your heart was set right. Help us to see our sin the way you see our sin and help us to see others' sins the way you see the sin on us. Forgive us for being judgmental and not loving. Forgive us for not receiving the whole counsel of your word and for trying to, in any way, shape, or form, um, form the word to fit our lives. We don't want to do that ever. Receive our heart. And while we pour, yourself, we pour ourselves into your word, so too, please pour your word into us. We ask it in your name, Christ our King. Amen. I offer you no apology for today's service, but I do ask you for a little quarter. I ask you for a little space in your heart right now that you would receive the things that I have to say and understand that they are from the heart of a God who loves you. They're from a heart of a, of a Savior who has your best intentions. Now, I also do apologize on behalf of Christians that might have in some way, shape, or form in your life made you feel judged, made you feel as though your particular sin was more egregious than theirs. Today's a hard service. It is. But it's an important one. It's for some of us the, the last bastion of freedom we thought we had, and yet the first step into a new life. Now, if you're confused yet and not fully understanding the things I'm saying, I, I totally understand that. Let's get to it. I will be here after the service if you want to take me to task on any of the things I'm saying, or if you want a deeper explanation. I'm always here for that. I'm not one of those guys that's, you know, I'm not going to bolt on you. I'm here. So ask. Verse 1, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. That a man has his father's wife. Please give me your attention. I told you it was going to be one of those services. You can circle that word for sexual immorality. And every place that word appears in the King James, in the Old English it is the word fornication. Fornication. Now, Paul received a letter from the church at Corinth saying, here's what's going on in our church. What do we do about it? Him, in returning this response, this letter back to them, says to the church, man, they told me that you guys have a sexual immorality going on there that isn't even named among the, the non-believers, that a man took his father's wife. Now, this is not to insinuate it was his mother, but like his, mother got, his, his father got divorced or his mother died, some they don't explain, and then his father got remarried, and then he took his father's wife, whether his father died or something. And it's like... He doesn't even know where to begin with them. Now, please understand this, and this is super important for your ongoing study. The word sexual immorality is the word porniaia. Porniaia. It does not mean the same word pornoia. Two separate words in the Greek. What's the difference, you may ask? Porniaia is the word adultery incest. It's a sexual immorality that is far more egregious or more obnoxious or like worse than the other word pornea, porneo, which means to indulge in unlawful lust, which basically means sex before marriage, sex outside of marriage. There are a few different words that represent fornication. Now, I see some of you guys 
or should I say I sense some of you guys squirming. We have some couples here that are unwed, that are engaging in that. Listen, stay with me before you get all mushy in your seat. This, what he's referring to, is not you. This is to the more egregious, incestuous, adulterous. However, know this. The attitude that we take towards somebody else's sin can often be... The attitude that somebody took toward our sin. Me and my wife, in case you don't know, we've been together for 30 years. We've been married for 25 our oldest daughter is going to be 30. So do the math. <sighs> so here's what you're not going to get here. You're not going to get judgment. Because, and this is the super most important thing here. I am not a cop. I'm a doctor. We in this church are not a church of policemen, we're a church of doctors. If you have incestuous sex, if you have premarital sex, you're not hurting me. You're hurting you. You're hurting your relationship, not mine. If you're engaged in pornography, you're not hurting me. Am I going to say, oh my goodness, you, how could you walk in here like that? Is, like, like, who has a kid? You know, setting this whole thing up, and I planned on doing this. What if your kid has a, a metal knife and goes over and tries to stick it into one of those outlets? Are you going to spank that kid? You stupid idiot. Are you going to, you could, you could. You stick a, you know what's going to happen when you stick a knife in that thing? You're going to blow the circuit out and hurt my house. No. That's a bad father. That's a bad mother. And sadly, some of us did have that bad mother and bad father. We did. If you stick that thing in there, it's going to hurt you, dingy. Don't do that. And you're going to hurt the one you love. Don't do that. Who are you to judge? Well, there's a difference between judgment and discernment. I'm not judging you like if you do that, you're going to go to hell. But I'm discerning like if you do that, you're going to feel like you're going through hell, dummy. How do you know? I just told you how I know. I've been with my wife for 20, married for 25 years. Well, things worked out okay for you. Really? You want to ask my wife that question? Not a day goes by that we do not suffer the consequence of our sin. Now, as ignorant as we were, as carnal as we were, as away from the Lord as we were, it doesn't change. You will be like me if you are sincere in this. And you will say, like I say to my wife, I wish I could have offered you myself pure. I wish I would have treated you like you were pure. Because I'm an idiot. I wish. Not just regret. Oh, well, I did it, I did it. Forget about all that. Forget about that. It's... My wife was more deserving of that than what I gave her. The first time I saw my wife, she sold me car insurance. I went in to get car insurance, and I, just, I was just dropped, floored, hit with a thunderbolt. I was just the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. So what do you do with such beauty? Do you defile it? Well, that's what I did. I'm not going to judge you. You want to have sex? You have all the sex you want. I could care less. 
But there is one who cares because you're sticking your knife in that thing. And when you stick your knife in that thing, don't think there's not a price to pay. You're going to blow out the circuit. You might be blowing out your own circuit. Figure it out the hard way if you want. And in the meanwhile, here's the only thing here in the church we ask. You ready? Verse 2. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Huh. You are puffed up. This is my prerogative. Don't tell me what to do. Uh, we are a tolerant church. We are all inclusive. We are, what's the word I'm looking for this day and age? We are, I forget. Huh? Prideful, absolutely good word. Uh, safe space, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. There's a word for like, we are, um, I, I'll remember, huh? Tolerant! There it is. We are a tolerant church. Now, there are people here who are gay, who, who were gay, who are going to be gay. There are people here who are engaging in premarital sex. They had premarital, they all, there, there's all kinds of different people here who are in different places. But here's what we cannot tolerate in the church, haughtiness about it. You cannot come here and teach others to do the same because it's really hard for a 15-year-old to tell me it's their prerogative to be gay and tell me that it's okay for other people to be gay. Why don't you be gay a little while, see how it works for you, then come back and tell me. But don't tell me before you've done it. And I'll tell you why I say that, potential gay person here. You ain't got nobody to take care of you if you're gay. No kids. You can't have a kid if you're gay. That's not how it works. Well, we can adopt. Okay, you can. That's a great idea. And if you think having two men or two women as a, a mother and a father figure is better than a mother and a father... Give it a shot. Statistics don't bear it up. You're not going to get judgment here. I'm glad somebody's going to adopt a kid. You're not going to get judgment here, but you're not going to be haughty here about it either. You know why? Because I've been where you're at. I did the premarital sex thing, and it caused me a lot of misery. A lot of misery. And for some of you guys, the first thing that happens when you have premarital sex is, well, now I should get married because I had sex. Well, maybe I shouldn't get married because I had sex. Well, should we get married because we had sex or shouldn't we? Well, now I'm afraid because if I get married because I had sex, then maybe I'm not marrying the right person. But if I don't get married, maybe I... Confusion. Immediate. Immediate confusion. So that's the only thing we don't tolerate. We're very intolerant toward haughtiness about sin. And not just that sin, although that's the sin people like to point to. Let's continue. Verse 3, for I indeed, the Apostle Paul speaking, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have already judged, although I were present, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one up to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit might be saved in the day of of the Lord Jesus. Now, it used to be a consensus among the world that that meant we should kill gay people, kill sodomites, kill perverts, kill people who are engaging in pornia, whatever you pronounce the word in Greek. That is not what it is, and I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you the, the complications we have now in the church because of it. Back then, there was one church in every city. That was it. And sometimes there was less than that, and you had to travel distances. Here, it's not like that. Here, there's a church in every corner, and many of them are way more tolerant than we are, and way more inclusive than we are, way more understanding. As a matter of fact, in this day and age, you can get a preacher who is the most prideful, arrogant, sack of junk there ever was. 
You can go to another church and they'll have a lesbian pastor. You can go to another church and have a gay minister. And, and all this stuff there, which, that's their business. You could find what you're looking for, if that's what you are looking for. But if you're looking for strict biblical adherence, I'd like to hope and pray that we will be as biblical as we can get. Stay with me. Like I said, I might say some things that push against you, but listen how it's done. That word for deliver does not mean deliver to death. It means to usher, to present, to bring before. It's not a violent word, so it never was to mean to kill them. It was always meant to show them the door, otherwise known as excommunication. Here's how it's supposed to be done. You find out that somebody is not just egregious in their sin, but they're haughty about it. And that's very important. Those two things have to go hand in hand. Who are we to judge another's sin? But what we can do is explain to one person why their sin should not be shared with others. Oh, listen, don't listen to Pastor. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm telling you, I have sex all the time and there's no Listen, I'm sorry, you, you can't teach our kids here how to screw their lives up. Why don't you do this? Why don't you go back out into the world, you have a great time, you have as much sex, drugs, and rock and roll as you want to have, and in about three years, you come back here, let us know how that worked out for you, okay? Because I'm telling you right now, it ain't going to work out so good. But if you don't want to listen to me, figure it out for yourself. Well, that church threw me out. No, we didn't throw anybody out. We just asked you to have a little decorum. We just asked you to be decent about it. And if I want to be bold, I just asked you to be a little bit shamed about it. At least when I went to church, when me and my girlfriend were living together, and my, my girlfriend was pregnant three times before we got married, we didn't walk around like, yeah, that's right. What, you got something to say? And that's the difference between being judged or being loved. You must stay with me. Please don't check out mentally because this chapter is far from over and it's going to add more information to what we're saying here. That will give you an understanding. So when you throw somebody out of the church, when you excommunicate them, they go back into the world or, well, don't worry. There's a family that left the church a couple of years ago and they know how judgmental you, you have been. So they'll take you in, they'll take your kid in and they'll tell them, don't worry, we know your parents, they're religious fanatics. Don't listen to them. You stay with us. We'll take care of you. You know how many people come to me and go, hey, I met this person and they're really low on money. They've, um, they're really really hurting right now. Um, I was thinking about you know, paying their mortgage for them. And I, I said, do, do you know their story? No, but I think the Lord brought them in my path. Yep, maybe the Lord brought them in your path to encourage them, but maybe God's got them right where they are, finally down to the end of themselves, and you're going to rescue them from the Lord. Now, if this sounds like I have a little bit more invested in this, I do. Somebody did that to us. In the attempt at trying to help somebody we loved, they rescued somebody we loved from what God was doing in their life. And it took them on a journey still to this day away from us. Don't be that person. Don't rescue somebody who God is boiling down. When somebody's at rock bottom, let them stay there. Let them stay there for a while. Sometimes you first got to save somebody's life before you save their soul. Somebody's all messed up on drugs and you shove a Bible in their face. Why don't we get them in a program first before we go shoving Bibles in their face? I can pray for them. That's probably better. You understand what I'm saying here or not? Continuing. Your glorying, verse 6, is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Now that's a little bit of, um, that's cooking um, 101. 
Leaven is yeast. And in case you've never seen what yeast does to bread, it's amazing. I used to work in a pizzeria years ago, and we used to make, we used to have the big, uh, we used to have the big vat, and first you put in all the, 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 um, the flour, a couple of different kinds of flour, some sugar, some butter. We'd have a few secret ingredients that I can't share. I've sworn to secrecy. <laughs> and then he would come, my, my, the guy that owned the pizzeria, he'd come and he'd cut that. What's that? That's the yeast. And he'd come in and he'd break it up. And he'd put it in water first and he'd break it up while it was mixing. Mix it, mix it, this big arm in there. And he said, don't get your arm in there. Pull your arm right off. And I'd go, whoa. Yeah, this is a big thing. Put this big hook. And he'd take this thing out. He'd throw it on the counter. He'd have this little cutter. Boom, boom, boom. Roll it up, roll it up. Put it in the pan. Roll it up. Whoa, that's cool. One day, you guys know this story. This is a great story. It's one of my favorites. He left me to close up shop. And he said to me, don't forget to finish the dough for tomorrow. Got you, boss. Well, it was about 10 o'clock. Take that big old dough, boom, throw it on the counter. My boys are outside. Come on, we want to go out. Come on. Got to cut the dough. Can you wait 40 minutes? Less than that. I was lying. Let's take it at least an hour. That cutting it up and roll. All right. Stay here, I'll be back later. So I go hang out with my boys. Of course, we're in the club all night. Get back, it's like five o'clock in the morning. Like, I'm gonna cut that dough up before boss gets here. I could not believe that the blob entered the pizzeria. And this piece of dough that was this big now was on the counter, on the floor, creeping up the counter. I was like, what the? That yeast, that's called leaven. And here, the Apostle Paul is saying, you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You got one person in your church that's telling everybody what they do is okay. If you don't deal with that, you're going to have to deal with it a lot. Yeah, but I don't want to be mean to people. I mean, like, I don't want to be judgmental, you know. I don't want nobody to leave. You know, if they, they'll leave here, they'll go to the church around the corner. You know, it's not like the old days. In the old days, people got thrown out of church. They had no place else to go. So they, but here, there's all these churches that will accept them. In the words of Ringo, bye. Well, bye. I got to worry about my kids. I got kids here. And if you want to drag your personal preferences in here, that's fine. But if you want to start teaching your personal preferences and they're against what the Bible says, I'm sorry. Come back when you change your mind. Come back when you realize that you were wrong. Open arms always. But that's the one place I can't draw. You guys might have been here. You guys have been here long enough. I learned three lessons the first two years of being a pastor. You know what the first lesson was? I don't defend God. Somebody says anything bad about God, oh, God this or Jesus. This. You know what? God doesn't need me to defend him. He's got his own. He's really strong. Number two, I learned, don't defend myself. God's got my back. You can trash me, say anything you want about me, whatever. God loves me. I know it. But you know what the third thing I learned was? You mess with God's people, I'm going to put a hurting on you. In every way, I will whoop you. Don't you mess with God's children, because I'm a shepherd, and I will protect the sheep. <coughs> Find out the hard way if you must. Continuing. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see, it didn't say holiness. You can't come in here holy. Nobody can apart from Christ. You can come in here and bring your sin. Nobody cares if you're gay, straight. Nobody cares if you're tranny. or Nobody cares. You're the only one that cares. Believe me, I know the people in our church. 
Nobody cares if you're having sex with your boyfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. The only thing we ask, don't tell somebody else it's okay. As the word goes forth, it will transform your life. It will change your heart. People come into me all the time and say, yeah, bro, here's the thing. I like church, man, but, you know, I still like smoking my herb. And I go, who told you not to smoke? Well, you know, I know that you people, you don't know nothing about my people. My people don't care how much herb you smoke. How about this? Smoke herb before you come to church. Did that dude just say to smoke pot before you go to church? Listen, just show up, basically. Show up. The word will transform you. All I'm here to do is give you the word of God. God will change. I am not some cop. Hey, what, what did you do last night? Don't you know what the Bible said? No. Here's my, here, here's the Bible. Here's the Bible. Here's the Bible. Let it change you as you go. It's not my job to change you. I got enough trouble trying to change myself. <laughs> Now, I want to share something with you that not a lot of pastors will share with you. <laughs> Another thing that not a lot of pastors. <laughs> if you keep your place here because we're going to come back, I want you to turn to the right, just a few pages, to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Watch this, and this is what makes this, what makes chapter that we're reading so powerful is what happens in the second letter that the Apostle Paul writes. This is so important. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, pick it up in verse 5. Watch this. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent. Not to be too severe, this punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. Please, before we read 7, he says, listen, you threw the guy out of church, and I'm proud of you for that. Give him a break now. Life has kicked him in the crotch. Literally. Go easy on the dude now. Watch. Verse 7. So that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Don't you know what you're doing will cause you plenty of sorrow? I'm not here to add to that sorrow. Paul says, give him a break, man. He's lived his life. He has to live the rest of his life knowing he slept with his father's wife. Give him a break now, man. Let him come back. Verse 8. Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. And they were. They threw the dude out of the church. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For indeed, I have forgiven anything. I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Back to the chapter. You throw him out of the church, you don't kick him out. Hey, dude, dude, come on back when you're ready to receive. And they did. And the guy, his life fell apart, and he wanted to come back, and apparently he wasn't being well received. Oh, no, the Apostle Paul said, Apostle says, Apostle says, listen, it ain't our job to judge. It's our job to love. Yes, we protect the sheep, but it ain't our job to judge. God judges. Let him back and affirm your love for him. No wonder gay people hate the church. Because there's so many churches telling them how much God hates them. Now, I'm not going to make it all in the church because it's the world. It's the, it's the media that keeps telling them, gay people and tranny people and all this other stuff, whatever, VZs or whatever they call themselves, keep telling them that we hate them. Listen, I'm 53 years old. I've never hated no gay person. I don't know. Maybe some of y'all did. I don't know any. I just don't. I don't care who you sleep with at night. You're not going to sleep with one of my kids, but... That wouldn't matter whether you're gay, straight, or whatever. The problem that we have in our day and age is what's called participation. 
Now, unless you participate in their sin, you are against their sin. And I'll put it to you this way. They ask me, are you for or against gay marriage? And I'll ask, in the church? Can't, can't marry two people of the same sex in the church. It's like you can't marry three people of different sex in the church. Just can't. It's not what the Bible says I can do. I only do what the Bible says. I am not, I'm not a marriage counselor. I'm not, a, um, I'm not anything except a Bible teacher and a pastor. That's it. That's what I do. So I can only do what the Bible says. Now, am I against gay marriage out there? No. Two people love each other, and they're going to make a commitment to take care of each other for their whole lives. You know what? You go right ahead. Well, won't you marry him then? I can't, because I only do what the Bible says. So you are against gay marriage. I'm not against gay marriage. I'm against doing gay marriage. Like, I'm not gay, and I'm not a gay pastor. I can't do that. You're against gay people. And that's what they tell us. We're against gay people. Why? Because I won't participate. That's it. And now listen, this ain't no joke. This goes even further. There are these YouTube videos where people are saying that it's homophobic if you don't date a transvestite. If you don't, are you allowed to call them transvestites? Or is, no, that's, so they're just trans? Now what is trans short for? Transgender. Okay, because I used to, when I was growing up, it was transvestites. Call them transvestites. And he's like, you look weird, but have fun. <laughs> we just didn't care. Just, I've never cared. I just, I know so few people. I knew, I knew, I knew people that went to the city and, and, and what we used to call it gay bashing. Let's go down to the village and bash gay. But I, there were so few of them. It wasn't that many. It re- just wasn't. None of my friends cared. Maybe it's the way I grew up. So now there's these videos, unless you are straight and you will date a transgender, then you're homophobic. Wait a second. Now, unless I participate? Nah, now that's where I draw the line. You can't tell me what I could think. That stops right here. So if that's hating gay people, then fine, I hate gay people. You know, you redefine your terms now. Go ahead. But I don't hate gay people. But if I don't have sex with a gay person, that means I hate gay people. Fine, then I hate gay people. Whatever, you know. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all don't. If you don't, come see me afterward. I'll explain it, and I'll show it to you. There's this whole thing. You guys know what incels are? Okay, there's a movement of incels. These people are involuntarily celibate. Incel, they call themselves. It's, a new, it's another one of the labels of genders that are now, and there's a whole movement of incels. Now, we've got to go find incels and have sex with them, and if we don't... Now, some of you guys are like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Is it really? Is it? Let me tell you what's really stupid. Do you guys ever hear the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? When the angels in Genesis went down to the city and wanted to stay in the city square, and Lot said, don't stay in the city square, please come and stay in my house. And then they went into the house, the angels went into Lot's house, and the, and the people of the city banged on the door and said, send those men out so we could have sex with them. And it's like, please don't do that, don't do that. You think that's like, when we first read that, we were like, that's the most ridiculous story. Gay people don't do that. Been to East Village lately? Oh, yeah, they do. Listen, not all gay people are gay Gestapo people, but believe me, there's a whole movement of gay Gestapo people. And that's a play on words, Gestapo, Gestapo. There's a whole movement. Like we used to go to the village and they had gay pride parades, right? And the gay pride parades would include people dressed up in leather nothings and spray paint their faces and, and be really flamboyant. And I had gay friends that used to go, I'm really sorry, that's just not us. That's the difference between you have to accept us for the way we are uh, versus, look, I'm gay, but not that gay. (laughs) And here's what this world will do. They will put you in a category like you have to be. Like growing up in my neighborhood, if you were Italian, you were a mobster. That was it. But I am Italian. 
but well, that one don't work for me. But don't let them pigeonhole you into thinking that LGBTQ, whatever else, other letters they've added to it, it means you have to be like them. There's a whole movement now called um, Brexit and um, Exit, which is all these people who are getting away and saying, no, we're not going to be what they called us to be. Black people are leaving the Democratic Party in droves now because for too many years they've been promised things that they're not getting from the Democratic Party. Gay people and lesbian people and, and all this are also leaving their different social groups and they're calling it Blexit, Gexit, all this other stuff because you know what? Why not just think for yourself? Why not have a thought on your own? I know I've gone someplace I shouldn't have. Continuing. Verse 9. I love this. Guys, I absolutely love this. Verse 9. I wrote to you in my epistle, that's the letter, not to keep company with sexual immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Please, verse... Guys, I know some people, they work at the church, their kids go to school at the church, they eat at the church, they, they shop at the church, everything is the church, the church, the church, the church. And here, the apostle's saying, I'm not telling you not to hang out with gay people, Set what you consider sexually immoral people outside the church? That's ridiculous. How else are we going to get them into the church unless we hang out with them and love them? So that, I don't understand how people do that, he says. He says li listen to, the, to the, um, the almost comedic sarcasm. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexual immoral people. And I certainly did not mean with sexual immoral people of the world or with the covetousness or with extortioners or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. Like out there, that's all you got. Sexually immoral, covetous, idolaters. I mean, that's all you have out there. And what is your job, Christian? To love them back to here. How are you going to love them to hear if you're too busy work? I just, I want a job at the church. And uh, oh my goodness, what's that? That's disgusting. Don't show me that. Like, what is that? Like, what is that? Like, we were in the world. I come home at 12 o'clock, take a shower, go back out, go to Miami at 2 in the morning, hang out till 5, get ready, go home, sleep an hour, go to work. Now we're in the church, like, I have to get my tight eight hours. When did we become so gay? <laughs> so weak. So ineffective. Man, I was the one at 1 o'clock in the morning, I could assemble a crew, and we could go to war at 3 a.m. But, but now I can't invite anybody to church because I don't want to hurt their feelings. He's gay, you know. I don't want him to feel like he's bad. Forget that crap. Bring them here. I want them here. <laughs> I love this. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. He says, if you have somebody in the church who's not just bold about their sin, and you see, it's not just sexual sin, it's just my prerogative to drink. Come on, let's go drink a few beers. Wait, brother, 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 brother. Do not be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Strong drink is a brawler, man. Don't, let's not do this. Don't you judge me. Listen, man. I'm sorry, brother. Every time we go out, though, you're, you're, you're drunk, man. You get me into a fight every weekend. I can't hang with you no more. You see how this works? It's not this, oh my goodness, my virgin ears. 
I love when people do that. I love when people in the world, I'm talking to somebody in the world, and they drop an F-bomb or something like that. They go, oh, sorry. And they go, ooh. <laughs> I go, I appreciate the apology, but uh, maybe God's the one you should apologize. Not me, because I could care less what you say. It ain't hurting me. Ooh. <laughs> now, my wife, that's a different story. She don't like that stuff, and so I respect it, and I don't do it. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves that evil person. You hear what he said? It's not your job to judge. God will judge them outside. Don't you think they know they're going to hell? You don't judge them. Let God judge them. You know what you do? Keep the church pure. Do your best to encourage, encourage, not judge, your brother to live holy, your sister to live holy. Do your best. It's hard. It's a dirty world. It's hard, man. It's hard to do the right thing in this world, even when you're going to church. So encourage them in love. Come on, you can do better. Not, oh, you did that? Oh, my goodness, I'm not going to hang out with you anymore. I'm not even going to eat with you anymore. Good, we don't want you to eat with us anyway. Does anybody have any questions about this? Comments. Maybe you have something in your heart right now that everybody else does too, but nobody wants to say anything. You see where we ended up here? It's not your job to judge the world. It's your job to love the world. All of it. Look, look at the list again. All right? Look at the list. Covetous, extortioners, idolaters. Reviler, drunkard, you see, sexually immoral. This, my brothers and sisters, is a list of what should be your friends. And if it's not, what are you doing? Are you telling me I should go out and make friends with these people? That's exactly what I'm saying. If you don't have these people as your friends, where have you been living? Church land? Live up in that holy land thingy up in Orlando? Either that or you're lying, and you have those friends but refuse to admit it, or worse, you have those friends, but you're not effective and being holy before them, so none of them are coming to know the Lord. That's who Jesus came to be with him. Yeah. Later on, a couple of chapters away, the Apostle Paul is going to say, I tell you the truth, those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he goes through the list. Homosexuals, sodomite, extortioners, pride. He goes through the list of people who will never inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says the greatest thing. He says, such were some of you, but you're not anymore because you were washed clean. We got it all crazy. And I don't know if it's the world that did it or some bad church person that did it. We think that we're something we're not. Hey, listen to me. I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where to get some food. That's all I am. Doing the best I can I haven't killed anybody or cheated on my wife yet, but it's only 1230. I'll let you know how I'm doing about five. And until then, I'll see you on Wednesday. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the word that you've placed before us. May we receive it on our hearts with thanksgiving, with willingness to change, um, without judgment and without without shame, but with understanding that you're still the God who heals us. Jehovah Rapha, heal us of our sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, Yeshua, Savior, Messiah. Bless us, please, that we would be friends with the world enough to get them in the church, but not enough for them to get us in the world.
We love you, God. Thank you for giving us understanding of what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it. Now, help us to live it. In Christ's name, amen.